Well, today, we kind of put a, a wrap-up on two different sermon series. A while back, we studied the seven churches that are mentioned in Revelation chapters 1 and through 3. And then we had a little break for Easter where we talked about the king who, and we filled in the blanks each week. Today, we talk about the king who is coming again But we're doing that particular topic from the very end of the book of Revelation. So today we will finish the book of Revelation in chapter 22 and finish the Easter series of The King Who. Um, Next week we start an exciting adventure. It's actually going to start our summer series because I am done with waiting for summer. Anyone with me? I know. So we're not going to wait until the weather tells us or the calendar tells us. We're starting our summer series next week. We're going to study the book of Genesis that will last us all the way through the end of August. Uh, And we're going to be discovering who our creator is. I'm going to talk about the names of God and who he is according to the book of Genesis. But for today, we're going to go all the way to the end of Scripture, Revelation 22, If you are able to uh, open your scripture, if you need a Bible, we do have some available, and um, we have some people that would be happy to bring you one. If you put your hand up, if you're in need of a Bible, you uh, may keep your hand up until you receive one. But if you have yours, turn to Revelation 22. We're going to read verses 6 through 21. It's a little bit lengthy, but um, we're going to see how John in the book of Revelation closes scripture. If you're able to stand as we read, that would be honorable to the Lord. But if your heart is reverent before the Lord's word, we understand that as well. Starting in verse 6. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Bless, uh, behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. You may be seated. I want to start with a question that I think many of you will have a different answer, but there'll be some similarities. What motivates you? What motivates you? 
Is it food? Maybe. When I think of motivation by food, I think of that classic like fishing pole taped to your back that's dangling a candy bar up and over your head and you're on a treadmill, right, and you're running for that candy bar. That's the motivation is food. Maybe it's money. Maybe your motivation is intimacy. Maybe your motivation is another person. Or maybe you do really well under a deadline and so you get real motivated when you're up against the crunch, right, of time. Or maybe... Your motivation is knowing that your pain or your suffering has an end. Hopefully none of you are thinking that right now. Like if I can just get through this sermon, that sermon has an end, right? (laughs) But we all have different motivation for different things. But I want you to think, what is your overall motivation in your spiritual life that motivates you in your everyday life? Movies like to toy with us in this category. They love to set up a final scene that looks like defeat until the hero arrives, right? And provides either victory or provides just enough motivation for everyone to suddenly become a skilled fighter, right? Movies love to do this. The reinforcements are coming so I know that I can keep fighting until I see them on the horizon. Movies love it. War movies do this. Romantic movies do this. Kids' movies do this. They leave that desperate moment hanging on the verge of failure until the hero arrives. During the four years of Nazi occupation, many of the people had started cooperating with the enemy. But there were small bands of brave fighters who waged continuous guerrilla warfare. They sabotaged rail lines, raided military bases, and gave information to the allied forces whose coming they eagerly awaited. The resistance did not know when British and American troops would finally land on their shores and parachute into their fields, but they had been given coded information to anticipate this arrival. On June 1st, 1944, the BBC broadcast their first coded message hidden within its normal programming. And it read this, Stand by, we are coming soon. Jesus, as you heard, very similarly transmitted a message to his church, to all believers, by saying, I am coming soon. One scholar estimates that there are 1,845, that's a specific number for an estimate, but estimates 1,845 references to Christ's return in the Old Testament alone. And in the 260 chapters of the New Testament, there are 318 references. That's one out of every 30 verses that talks about Jesus' return. 23 of the 27 New Testament books refer to Christ's return. For every prophecy in the Bible about Christ's birth, there are eight which look to his return. In Revelation 22, 6 through 21 that we read, there's three specific reminders from Jesus himself that he is coming again. Verse 7, look, I am coming soon. Verse 12, look, I am coming soon. And verse 20, surely I am coming soon. He's talking to John, but there must have been some lady named Shirley there as well, right? (laughs) Surely I'm coming soon. Three times in this passage, Jesus says, I am coming soon. Wait for me. Look for me. And so I argue that the answer to our question, what is our motivation, Maybe we need to say what should be our motivation. And it's the one who is coming. It's the king who is coming again. No matter how good your life is right now, the world that is coming when Jesus returns is a world that you are going to want to be a part of. Because Jesus is there. While the Apostle Paul wasted away in prison... He could see the bridegroom on the horizon, his hair white like snow, his eyes filled with fire, his feet like burnished bronze, his face like the sun shining in full strength. 
The man he had walked with, talked with, laughed with, and surely cried with, now fully glorified and ready to receive and rescue his bride, the church. The treasure was no longer hidden in a field, but riding on the clouds. Even the vision of the new heavens and new earth in Revelation 21 makes God himself the greatest prize of the world to come. It says in verse 3 of chapter 21, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Yes, we want a world without grief, without pain, without fear, and without death. But better to have a world like ours with God than any other world without him. His presence defines paradise.